welcome to another fantastic episode of Pitch Cafe podcast. This episode to me is really special because we have the Women's History Month going on and I am in awe of today's guest. She is a true leader in more than one ways and she is a revolutionary thinker. When I attended her webinar on breast cancer awareness, I was not only impressed with the boldness with which she went about supporting this cause, but I am also in awe of her uh, intelligence, her ability to grasp concepts and present concepts. They say that as you go towards sea level and in a very male dominant academic ecosystem, very few people are there, uh, you know, as women at the top. She's probably one of them because of her intellectual abilities and her ability to nurture because of which she has chosen breast cancer as a cause she would like to support. Today she has, does not have a day job but she is in a position where she is enabling multiple ecosystems open up and talk about breast cancer at the grassroots level. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lopa Mudra Das Roy. She is a PhD in the field. She has also been a professor at very, very reputed institutions like Kellogg and uh, North Carolina at Charlotte. So uh, without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lopa Mudra Roy. Thank you so much, Vida. It's an honor to be here. And thanks for the generous introduction. I mean, uh, I feel very humbled. I don't know what to say. Fantastic. Uh, so, Lopa, you know, let's get started with who is Dr. Uh, Lopa Mudra Roy? Uh, uh, who, who are you? You know, what do you define yourself as? I know that you're a woman influencer. Uh, I follow your posts on breast cancer. You you come up with so many different ways to empower this community. But who is uh, Dr. Roy? Who is Lopa Mudra Roy? very good question and I think if you ask me who I am I would say I'm someone who who is always standing up for something that I feel is not right you know I'll never keep quiet on that so that is someone who is that person is always within me and uh, that's the reason why whenever I would see something that would affect me you know from in the from the moral standpoint I would always speak up for that and um, so Coming back to my story, if you ask me, thankfully, I mean, I would say I'm very blessed to be born in the family of physician. My father, um, he was a pediatrician and uh, he was Dr. Chandrasekhar Das. I lost him in 2020. My grandfather was also a physician and my mother was a social worker. She was a professor, but she gave up her career for the family and now she's dedicated to the community. So that's my uh, background, you know, who, because I always feel that our roots define us, our upbringing defines us. And I would say that's who I am. And um, I have always grown, I grew up in the family where we would discuss anything and everything about the healthcare system, you know? so. So that was the boldness because my father, being a pediatrician, he was a revolutionary on his in his own time because he would always speak about breast milk and you know how the mothers can feed their kids uh, and that was a big standpoint during those times and I grew up listening to this word breast milk all the time and then you know when I was 12 year old and um, it was like I was in Gohati in Assam and one of my friend's mother she died and when I went uh, uh, for the funeral I kept asking I was always a curious child you know that is another thing I would say that defines me is that I would always keep asking like the five whys you know why 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 and then mm-hmm. I went and asked like how how did she die and at that time even to utter the word cancer it was a big taboo they didn't want to say when I insisted more then finally they said it was cancer but I then I my next question was cancer where and they didn't want to say it was in the breast and that's when you know eventually they said breast cancer in a hush hush way and I repeated breast cancer they're like Shh, I'm not supposed to talk about it and it really impacted me I felt that this is the respect we are giving to a mother that we lost her and we can't discuss the disease that caused her life and uh, 
I think that that's something I carried with me all throughout. And then I became a, a basically my PhD, and then I did my postdoc from Mayo Clinic College of Medicine in cancer research. And Gosh. then I was a professor at University of North Carolina, a principal investigator, working with all this molecular level high end. You know, whatever a scientist would want to, I had everything in my life, right? And then I was doing my MBA from Northwestern Kellogg School of Management. So when I was doing all of this, I was at the supreme of my career. At that point, uh, and I would always go back for the conferences and I would meet the oncologist telling me how women with breast cancer are dying because they're still presenting late. And that again affected me. And it was always, I would say, there was a calling, you know, and I kept thinking that if I think about my career, I will never be able to do what I believed in myself will help make a change because we were thinking of big things in the world, but we were forgetting something very fundamental that is breaking the breast tap and that became the tagline and that's when in 2017 I resigned from my career and that was the inception of Breast Cancer Hub where I wanted to do the population outreach, translate all the information I had to the community, give simple solutions but sustainable solutions and then making the tagline as break the breast taboo but another tagline as together we save lives because I always believe that I cannot do it alone. We all have to come together. So a lot of times people ask, how do you differentiate? And I always say, why do we have to differentiate? Can't we come together? Because we are yeah. fighting for a bigger cause, the cause of cancer. So I think if you ask me who I am, I would say in a nutshell, I'm someone who wants to bring the change at the grassroots level, providing sustainable solution, but I want to do it together because I always believe in teamwork and uh, and that's, that's how I think I function. And for me, relationship is the most important thing, Gita. So that's, I think that helps me to grow, um, you know, because, and that's the culture I believe in, that uh, every time, you know, the oneness, the togetherness, and for the purpose, and which is the bigger purpose is serving the community. I think that's a very uh, thrilling uh, story, an enchanting story. Uh, you are truly driven by a mission much, much bigger than yourself. You mentioned that uh, breast is a taboo for a lot of people. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that breast is a taboo? What kind of society are we living in? If you look at the aboriginals, the tribal people, no part of the body is a taboo for them. Everything is divine. Everything is a part of nature. Everything has a very uh, uh, great purpose and they worship it. We are educated society. We are sophisticated society. We have so many degrees and we have so much to, uh, you know, back us in terms of knowledge base. Where did the human race go wrong? Why do people have this taboo? Why do you wow, think that is? A, yeah. That's a wonderful question. And that I always had that in my mind. And, you know, Vida, I'll tell you this. I think where we make the mistake is right here where I was making the mistake too because when I have two boys and now they are one is going to be 11 in April and the other one is 12 so when they were four and five year old right three four and like that age so I started to talk to them about private parts you know and I said you know breast is a private part you know so that is how I started and you shouldn't mention about the private parts so that's how we we do this upbringing in our kids. Then what happened was my older one, Agastya, I think he was four year old or something, and or five, I can't remember. So one of my friends came, you know, to my house and uh, she said, Lopa, how is your work going in the lab? And I said, oh, you know, it's going great. My breast cancer cells that I was growing in the lab, it was, uh, it's growing good. And my, the project on breast cancer that I had. So after my friend left, Agastya comes to me and says, mama, you are very bad. You are a bad person. I said, what did I do wrong? He said, you said a bad word. You said breast. And that's when I realized, you know, that's where each one of us are going wrong because it's the culture that we are imbibing in our next generation. 
and then immediately i switched and what you said vida is so true is the divine right every part every organ is divine and that's when i felt that so i think everything starts at home and i started to tell my kids that this is just another part of the body and we need to respect the part and so that's why you will see that i'm teaching even like a 6 year old now will talk about breast self examination so initially this was in charlotte not many parents love like to that all they were like why are my kids talking about breast but now they are the parents who are coming back to me and saying that i want my kids to volunteer at breast cancer hub so this are this is something uh, we the i feel that we ourselves are the reason because we are educated we try to make this education in such a way that we ourselves are building the stigma in our society and i think if we start to start to imbibe this in our next generation that breaking the breast taboo and it's just an organ it's nothing else it shouldn't be defined as an organ like a sex organ you know how many times we are defining it as so that would be the basic and and probably as you said in the tribal areas but they are not thinking as much right they yeah. are not having those um, information and they are not absorbing as much and they are so free they are so open and pure at heart i think that pureness we are missing and that's why these issues are arising fantastic that's a great answer and i really like the way how you changed yourself in your life you made the change and now you have set a role model for everybody else to follow that's what leaders do in that sense you're a true leader now this is a question i want to ask every uh, true leader every visionary what is your vision what is your mission and what's your passion your passion is very visible anybody who talks to you can uh, you know absorb your passion that's why i have you on the podcast but honestly what's your vision what's your mission and what's your passion so my vision is that we should not be losing any women or men or lgbtq plus community or anyone to breast cancer or any types of cancers when we think of breast cancer because my heart sinks when i see the women detected late and when i knew know that they could be saved so that's my vision you know that is something that uh, keeping that in mind i am progressing my mission is how to bring those changes so the first mission that i had was population outreach and please know vida that i am so it is my 100% voluntary so best cancer hub is a volunteer driven organization every services are free of cost and everything that we raise is going for the community so that's the beauty of how you know we are um, we are conducting all our programs so the mission was initially that population outreach i will go to the people and then talk to them about breast cancer awareness but then when i was thinking about it i always felt that what could be the systemic solution you know sustainable solution we can't be going and talking big words and that's when the another mission came up was how to give a solution to the people and that's where the solution came in is breast self exam card and we have it for the first time for men and women and we have it in 24 languages so every time we the it was like improvised you know i never had a static thing in my mind that i'm going to do this 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 it was based on the circumstances based Based on the situation, I changed the, the mission and goals. Also started to change, and that's when I started to do the population outreach, but taking accountability. Because everyone has my WhatsApp number, the email addresses, they can reach out to me, and I'll navigate them towards the right direction, right healthcare facilities, and guide them medically. And also, like you know, like in, we we have built support groups. Like we have local support groups. We have. Uh, So, like for example a whatsapp group private support group so what i say is only 5% of our work is published everything is done privately because of the patient privacy so that is another mission that is helping so much because what scientists me as a scientist another oncologist cannot do a survivor does it when he or she tells the patients that you yeah. will be saved you know yeah. so this yeah. is another important area that we are covering we have adopted villages we are going now door to door because i realize one thing is 
taking care end to end. So we have adopted now 11 villages when we were going door to door teaching them about not only breast cancer screening, about other types of cancers. And that's when we expanded from breast cancer hub now to different wings because cancer, when we are going to these people, they are not talking about breast alone. They're talking about cervical cancer, other organs, you know, where they're having concerns. So that is another project that we are dealing with uh, is that taking care for different types of cancers. But these villagers, even if we go and tell them door to door that you might be a suspicious case of breast cancer, they will not go to the hospital. So taking them from their home to the hospital is our um, responsibility. Even like what they do is um, basically they will tell us that we are daily wage earners and no one else from the family will accompany the patient because we are losing two days or uh, two persons wages. Our team does it. So our team will take them to the hospital. They are, our team are the local field workers. So then we pray the treatment. We are doing the treatment. Uh, we are paying for their aid, everything. So, you know, it is so fulfilling that when we are seeing that we are saving these individuals who has no one to help them, basically holding the hands of the underprivileged sectors, that is something that I would say is very satisfactory. Similarly, we are also saving the lives of the urban sectors too, because we are providing them all the guidance. They, it may not be financial guidance because we cannot afford that, but we are help taking care of them through support system, through support group, medical guidance and all of that. So these are different missions I have and of course research. Research at the grassroots through epidemiology study, clinical data analysis, so that we can make changes in the healthcare policies. So thinking of the long run and bringing lots and lots of grassroots uh, uh, you know, data to the community, to the, to the world, because like when I'm going into different pockets in Africa or in India, and now today, like we are also collaborating in Bangladesh and of course in US too, I'm seeing that whatever is represented is only from few repositories. So what is the real data? So these are the different areas that like basically bridging the gap in different areas in the cancer scenario. That is the mission, how we can bridge it and how we can, you know, make those changes, but give, but providing sustainable solutions. Fantastic. So, uh, Lopa, I have seen this issue in uh, other startups, but who are working uh, in the villages, getting the villages to come out of the house and go to the hospital, getting the villages to come out of the hospital to register uh, for a bank account. This seems like a very difficult task. You're based here in the United States and you have adopted 11 villages. How do you run this show? What is your business model? Yes, a very good question. So I actually, all these villages, I'm always there for them. It's not that uh, Vida that I'm sitting here and I'm just uh, talking to the project coordinator. So when I started also the village that we adopted, I actually went there to do the outreach. So this was in July, 2019, and it is in Southern Assam in a tea garden area. So mm. when I went and did the outreach, suddenly I saw one of the girls like profusely crying. And then she told me in a very authoritative way, why didn't you come to like in Hindi, you know, why didn't you come to my village last year? My mother just died because she was shy and she didn't want to uh, talk to anyone because she didn't even know it was cancer. So I told her emotionally that, I couldn't save your mom, but no other moms will die from your village. And that's the village adoption started. So then what I did was when I was in there, so I'm in India for three months, for four months like that, Vida. So I went and collaborated with the local cancer hospital. So over there, we have Kachra Cancer Hospital and Silchar Medical College. I met the director, Padma Shri Ravi Kannan, Dr. Ravi Kannan. So basically I made my team to be introduced, the project coordinator, we had the training in the Kachar Cancer Hospital for our team. So these are the groundwork that I went and did. And then what I did was I made sure, like as you said, right, even from the registration, everything our team does. So for example, these people, their income level is below poverty line, but they yeah. will have no documents because when they're going to the hospital, they have to show the document, right? So our team goes to the offices, make sure with their income certificate that all the certificates are there, they will take them to the hospital with the transport. Even in COVID, the challenges we face. So our village adoption started 
February 2020, when I was in India, I came back here, COVID started, and then our village adoption was going on in parallel. So all the challenges we were able to overcome. And uh, so that is how we are functioning. Now, when it comes to the revenue model, Vida, so ours is totally community-driven revenue. So what happens is, so we couldn't have any BCH fundraiser last two years. But yeah. what I started to do was uh, because of the COVID, but you know, all the, the community members, for example, small kids, they will bake cakes and they will sell it and they will raise the money and give it to BCH. So many times few people said, you know, like, uh, uh, can we do GoFundMe? And I always said, please don't do GoFundMe. I want people to feel it, understand it, because GoFundMe is a very generalized thing. So I yeah. want people to come and donate only those who believe in Breast Cancer Hub. And trust me, that is what worked. I was starting to post our work on the social media and because zero revenue for marketing, as I said, right, 100% goes for the cost everything was mostly word of mouth and also like our free social media facebook linkedin people started to see the work they went to the donate button and started to donate and other business model i would say Vida, is our ethics integrity and transparency that helps to gain more donors because i was starting to put like our financial is cpa certified and our revenue is like it's all posted under the donate button so we had like last year $31,000 31, um, last year's full revenue. Before that year, it was 34000 So with that, we are putting everything for the cause. So this is how we were functioning. And uh, in between, we also had to provide food relief to all the villages, right? Because when we were going door to door for screening, we saw they were eating rice with chilies. So, you know, and, and the project coordinator, I still remember, she called me in the middle of the night. She said, Ropa, what do we do? I said, we have to provide them food and we had zero funding for COVID relief. So I went back to few donors and mostly our board members and I asked them, can we use your donation for food relief? They said, please go ahead. And that's when, you know, we provided food replenishment to those individuals who were in lockdown. We didn't let them come in and stand in the line because their dignity was more important for us. We went door to door because we had database of every individual who was on lockdown and we provided the food. So that is our business model, you know, like improvising based on the situation, but our community is stepping up to donate. This is uh, very impressive. What is the scale of impact you're having? I know scale is not important. You're, you're providing a very high quality service and this is um, uh, community driven. So it's very impactful. I can tell from the uh, examples you just quoted, your volunteers are pretty engaged if they are so concerned and uh, a girl comes and walks up to you and asks, uh, why didn't you come early? So she has that comfort level with you. So yeah. what is the kind of scale you have started with? Yes, that's a very good point. So this year, actually, we just had our board meeting yesterday. So I had to present the impact also. So I think I have the numbers in my mind, but I can share it with you, whatever the impact is afterwards, if you want to show it to the public. And I'm we are to, everything is open for us. So I think last year, so also we had uh, around 9,315 individuals. We screened for the door-to-door, -door, um, you know, like uh, screening in the villages. And we had the number of families also um, mentioned, but from there, 116 individuals were suspicious cases whom we took to the hospital to care end to end. Other than that, we also total, I think, um, I have the numbers, if you want, I can pull it up Vida, for you, but uh, you know, just, but we had to, in Africa, we helped with the treatment for approximately 50 individuals. And I think in India, approximately 137 individuals for the treatment aid. Going to the outreaches, right? Every out, we had more than 300 outreaches conducted in addition to the webinar and in person. And from there, I think every outreaches, we had more than, I can't remember in numbers, but innumerable lives we have saved because around four every day I'm receiving emails or you know of ten individuals reaching out saying I went over there they heard my uh, webinar and now they have the symptoms so what do we do so this is yeah. the impact level we are having and uh, I think it's like more than um, thousands and thousands of people we have reached out who are now aware who were zero awareness to hundred percent awareness in the villages we went. The outreaches we are conducting, that is also the same impact from 
hardly awareness now like they are doing breast self exam every month i have counseled more than 4000 uh, like you know individuals like when they are going for the outreaches plus one on one and also like our support group itself has i think around 200 or more than that in the support group itself like in the whatsapp group so these are the different numbers like on the high level which i know that we are making direct impact but indirect impact is in social media and all other places you know where we are putting out all the early detection signs and symptoms and i'll tell you one more interesting thing with the many times lot of many of our volunteers will feel bad for like they'll think that okay we are posting this but we are getting one or two likes and what i tell them is don't worry don't go by the numbers of likes we have or don't go by how many followers we have because these individuals when they have concerns because they are viewing it they reach out to me and i tell them like how did you know they said we saw a social media post so basically yeah. even to put a like in there it is so taboo a lot of people think that we don't want to support a cause of cancer we will get cancer these are the statements i heard from the community you can imagine we the where we live right so basically these are different so but i always tell everyone we should never give up because we have to be persistent on our um, social media impact because people are viewing and when they have concerns they are reaching us so that is the indirect measure that i am talking about yeah so uh, lopa uh, with that being said you are a you are a woman entrepreneur because you are a individual entity right now and you are driving so many ecosystems you present to the board uh, so you are bona fide entrepreneur what are some of the challenges you faced as a woman entrepreneur and what's your advice to the uh, women community um, who are uh, you know in in the venture ecosystem or in the startup ecosystem uh, what is your advice to them or even the stem kids or the stem girls who are you know dreaming of being like you one day what is your advice to them so my advice is that you know because um, first thing is that uh, we the if you have a dream you have to believe in it and never give up i had i still have challenges every day when i started off you know as an entrepreneur i would reach out to the organizations you know and they would think in different ways like why is this woman going to come there are so many questions and then the most big challenge i faced were from the male counterparts as you said like you know they would be thinking like okay, why are we going to why do we have to listen to her who is she you know we know is that um, thing that we have all the knowledge you know especially but i keep telling like because they they are invited for this talks of mine where they would be like coming with this ego like who and then when they see me this is like a tiny woman coming in the room and they would be like why are we here to listen to her but then what i'm trying to do i always tell everyone i know where the problems are that is where i'm bringing it up to the to the even the most educated uh, forum of doctors or oncologists and i'm telling them that these are the gaps we are having and that's when it's an eye opener so i always feel that knowledge is power and data is power so we have yeah. to be for the stem students also your it shouldn't be empty vessel sound you have to be so genuine i think the genuinity we are missing uh, in many cases i see those gaps you know so i always tell everyone be who you are you and then always be genuine and that shows up and also yeah. when you are in stem you need lot of patience like in research i would do 100 experiments 90 would fail and 10 would show yeah. good results but that yeah. doesn't mean that i'm going to you know from those 10 or from those 90 are my learning experience too and i know that how i can do the i can troubleshoot and do the things better so i think in stem i would always encourage the students not to take any shortcuts because i have seen in research you know the shortcuts that can be taken for quick results but i always told my students that ethics is so important in research because that's what will gain help you to gain respect you know yeah. because because when you are uh, very true with your data that is so important in stem so i think these are different variables help me to be able to connect to the community and i another thing i feel is the simplicity keep things simple yeah. you know not to talk big words which we are not able to uh, provide or keep up to so simple solutions small steps 
but uh, sustainable steps that is very important i think uh, you summarized it very well uh, in fact if you look at why 9 out of 10 startups are failing they are not simple uh, in their steps vision messaging they are not sustainable they are overshot in their expenses or they have not understood the customer market needs and uh, third thing they are not genuine they start off something else and they pivot and become something else and when they're pitching this pivot version they are not being themselves so this is very practical advice to any entrepreneur not just women entrepreneur i would definitely um, use this message as much as i can thank you so much for that summarizing today's podcast you started off with your journey why you're doing what you're doing and how your childhood was a great impact your parents you know helped you break the taboos and after that you talked about uh, your academic background where you came from your degree and what inspired you to take this step in breast cancer you talked about your passion vision and mission and now this whole genius model you're operating very successfully at the grassroots level and you also talked about why it's working as a woman founder why you have so much confidence and what are the three uh, success mantras so you know wrapping up the podcast uh, if i were to ask you for one golden advice you want to give uh, to the uh, women entrepreneurs in the women history month or to the general public what would that be I would say never change yourself for others. You have to believe if you are believing in your dream, go for it. There will be thousands of challenges, but we just have to come up because and everything should come from the heart. I think that is that is the mantra and customer segment, you know, you have to improvise and work for the people, understand the needs and then and then mold yourself. do not be yeah. static you have to yeah. be flexible i think these yeah. are the different uh, ways and one last thing is i always believe that we should work together even if yeah. it is for the business model even if it is for the profit or non profit because this world this world is about network and collaboration so that is very important for all of us to understand yes vasudeva kutumbakam we are all one family and uh, oh, what an amazing way to end this fantastic podcast alopa uh, mudra roy you are truly an inspiration beyond words your uh, vision is uh, truly uh, world changing i would say at many levels you are a revolutionary and a visionary i wish you all the very best in your endeavors at breast cancer hub and uh, i urge everyone who's listening to this to reach out to her support her cause and uh, take it to the next level thank you so much thank lopa. you thank you so much vida and it's an honor to be here and i feel blessed to know you you know because you are helping us to spread the word about the cause right so together we save lives so you are paying the dose yeah. thank you so much thank you thank i appreciate you. it thank yeah. you bye